Hey everybody, it's Erica hanging out with Kenai and Makui today. So today I wanted to address the topic of having a non-native wolf reintroduced into Colorado. But before I get into this, I do need to start with a little bit of a biology lesson on how species and subspecies work in wolves. I will preface, this is not Wolf Education 1000, this is more like Wolf Education 2500. So put on your thinking caps and follow very closely. Canis lupus, also known as the gray wolf or the timber wolf, is a species of wolf in North America. Now a species is defined as a population or a group of populations that can interbreed between themselves. How many species of wolves exist is debated and unnecessary for this vlog. Now subspecies of wolves have three parts to their scientific name. The first two parts, Canis lupus, tells you what species it is, and the third part tells you the subspecies. Now a subspecies is loosely defined as a group within a species, and these groups differ based upon where they live compared to other groups in that species. How many species exist is also largely debated, and ranges anywhere from 4 to 38, depending on what source you're looking at. For the purpose of today's vlog, I'm going to tell you about five of the more commonly known subspecies of wolves in North America. There is Canis lupus arctos, commonly referred to as the arctic wolf, white wolf, or polar wolf. They can be found in parts of North America and Greenland, and generally weigh anywhere between 70 to 150 pounds. That is a very large size variation for a wolf. There is Canis lupus bailei, which is commonly referred to as the southwestern wolf, the Mexican wolf, or lobo. They can be found in only a very small portion of New Mexico and Arizona. They are the most endangered subspecies of gray wolf. And generally, they will weigh between 60 to 70 pounds. There is Canis lupus lycon, which is commonly referred to as the northeastern wolf or the eastern wolf. They are currently only found in Canada, and recent studies think or show that they may actually be a separate species, but they have not yet been reclassified. There is Canis lupus occidentalis, which is commonly referred to as the north, <laughs> as the northwestern wolf, the Canadian timber wolf, the Alaskan timber wolf, the Rocky Mountain wolf, or the Mackenzie Valley wolf. Now, this is the wolf that was reintroduced into Yellowstone in 1995. And the average weight of Canis lupus occidentalis ranges anywhere from 70 to 130 pounds. Again, a pretty large variation in size there. Then there's Canis lupus nubilis, which is commonly referred to as the Great Lakes wolf, the Great Plains wolf, or the Buffalo wolf. Uh, this is the wolf that most likely inhabited most of the western United States, including Colorado. It was thought to be extinct in the 1920s, uh, but the wolf that currently inhabits the Great Lakes region is actually thought to be a descendant of this wolf, and these wolves generally weigh about 84 pounds. So the system we use to categorize living things works really well until you get down to the subspecies level. In order to have a distinct subspecies, you need isolation between populations. Since wolves have very large territories and move around North America quite freely, there really isn't that isolation between populations, except for maybe with your Mexican gray wolves. So do you see how the movement of wolves throughout North America could make it difficult to divide them into distinct subspecies? I think there's also a lot of 
misunderstanding in the general population about how many types of wolves are just in the United States alone. When I was talking about those five different subspecies of wolves, do you recall how each of them had three to five different names that they were commonly called? I think this is where a lot of the misunderstanding and confusion comes from. We hear wolves talked about by all of these different names, and we assume that they're all separate types of wolves. So most people think there are a lot more wolves, uh, a lot more types of wolves in the United States than there really are, when in reality, there are arguably, arguably only about three subspecies of wolves in the United States. So now that I have hopefully helped you better understand how types of wolves work, I can talk to you about the accusation of having a non-native wolf reintroduced into Colorado. I am going to use Yellowstone as my example because the same accusation was made of those wolves. People commonly state that the wolves reintroduced into Yellowstone were a larger, more aggressive subspecies of wolf than the native wolves were. Sure, Canis lupus occidentalis was probably 6 to 8 percent larger than the native wolves, but this is actually a very common size variation even with wolves in the same subspecies. The reason that the wolves reintroduced were larger than the native wolves is more likely due to there being a large time gap between the extinction of wolves in Yellowstone and the reintroduction. So the differences in the reintroduced wolves probably comes from environmental factors that change over time and geography, not because they were a different type of wolf. Everything in nature is constantly changing and adapting. Take polar bears, for example. Polar bears today are on average smaller than they were 30 years ago. This is most likely due to a warming climate and shorter hunting seasons. The polar bears that live today are still the same type of polar bear that lived 30 years ago. So no, Canis lupus occidentalis was not the native wolf to Yellowstone. Canis lupus nubilis was probably the wolf that originally inhabited the area, but these wolves were exterminated in the area by the 1940s. And the reason that Occidentalis was chosen to repopulate the area rather than Nubilis is due to prey. So Occidentalis is imprinted on the types of prey that you would find in Yellowstone, elk and mule deer, whereas Nubilis is imprinted on white-tailed deer. So biologists thought it would be better to introduce a wolf that was already comfortable with hunting the type of prey that were going to be in the relocation area. Otherwise, the wolf population probably would have had a hard time growing because they first would have had to learn how to hunt a different type of prey. So putting all of this information together, I cannot conclude that the wrong wolf was or will be reintroduced. One, uh, Size varies quite a bit, even between the same subspecies of wolf, that it just doesn't make sense to use that as a determination of a type of wolf. Two, subspecies is very fluid. There is so much movement of wolves throughout North America that we can't really figure out when one subspecies stops and when the other starts. What am I trying to get at with all of this here? Um, with a couple exceptions, basically, no matter what subspecies of wolf is reintroduced into Colorado, we're still going to see the positive ecological impacts that Colorado ecosystems need. Now, if you're not familiar with what these benefits are, you can refer back to vlog four where I did talk about all of the ecological benefits wolf restoration would have in Colorado. Hopefully I haven't confused you guys too much today. That's probably a little bit more of a biology lesson that you signed on for, but hopefully you get a better understanding of the types of wolves that we have here in North America and how subspecies isn't that big of a difference when it comes to wolves. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you on the next one.